Hello, welcome to our latest edition of Women Talk Tech. I'm Deanna Kosaraju, I'm founder of the Global Tech Women. And today we're really excited to have Dr. Carolyn Samard here, who's going to talk about uh, some of the hallmarks that you should look for in a welcoming culture for technical women entitled Before You Sign the Offer. So here, uh, I just want to remind you as well that we will have Q&A uh, at the end of the session. I also will be moderating the stream. So if you have questions as we go through the process, please feel free to go ahead and ask them. And we'll try to find a place uh, to, that she can answer the question, or we will wait till the end. So here's Carolyn. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar, and it's a, really a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to be a part of this new organization and have the opportunity to do this webinar and also try this very cool new technology. Um, I think, Todd, I'm really excited to be a part of this and try this. So I'm Carolyn Samard. Um, I'm a STEM diversity consultant, and I'm also associate director at Stanford University for um, diversity and leadership. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you uh, for years at the New Morgan Institute as well. So it's really exciting to be here. And what I want to talk about today is most of my work has been grounded in research, trying to come up with evidence-based solutions that people can, can implement. And today I'm going to use some of this background to really talk about what should you know as a woman in technology? What should you look for in a company when you're considering joining an organization? The reason why um, I'm interested in this topic, and Deanna and I have brainstormed and came up with this, is that most of the advice you will get when you're job hunting will, you know, consider resume tips, how do you get a high-level position, how do you negotiate good salary, but the reality is there's a lot that remains, that remains unobserved and unset in this process. And research has documented that there's a lot of barriers for women in technology, specifically for technical women. Uh, and those are grounded in company culture. So um, if you join a company and you don't have quite the right support, you can experience isolation, a lack of access to mentors and the networks that determine advancement, bias and stereotyping, work-life conflict, bad managers, and unwelcoming cultures. And if this seems daunting, daunting, it is. Uh, there's a lot of things to watch out for. And what you look for in a company also depends on where you're at in your career and what your goals are. So, you know, depending on where you're at, it may make sense to join one type of company if you're at early career stage, mid-career stage, or senior uh, level. So it's not just about them interviewing you. It's about you interviewing them and doing your due diligence so you end up in a supportive culture and you can accomplish your career goals. And I think this is a great time because for a long time people would tell me, well, you know, I really can't negotiate. There's no jobs out there. Well, I think, you know, technical women are in the driver's seat nowadays. Your skills are in high demand uh, and they will continue to be in high demand. So here's the framework to think about this. Um, every question you ask when you consider a new position should be grounded in your career goals. And that is really personal. So I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, here's a checklist of what makes for a good organization or a bad organization. Uh, it really depends on what your specific career goals are, and that's something that only you can answer. But looking from the lens of your career, career goals, consider the specific dimensions of colleagues and community, manager, work-life fit, opportunities for growth, support, advancement opportunities, and location. And I added location for a specific reason. Um, and so it, this is much more than about the title or the salary that you're going to get. It's really about finding an employer that's the right fit for you, considering your career goals at this specific time in your career. And what makes for the right fit now may not make for the right fit five years later. So first, I would say um, start at the core. Uh, when you start to job hunt, it can be because you're unsatisfied with your current position. It can be because you're finishing your degree. I apologize, I made the computer shake. Um, start with defining your career goals. And to find the right position and the right employer, it has to start 
with what is your own vision for your career. What's the dream? What's the shoot for the stars goal that you're trying to accomplish, right? Where do you want to be in five years? Um, and sometimes this can be a little unclear, but having some sort of an idea of where you want to go in the future can really help you make the right decision from the start. Is this offer taking you closer to this vision, right? And it's not about being rigid. So, for example, I may want to become president of the United States. Um, these days, I absolutely would not want that job, but let's pretend that I do. Um, and some people may say, well, you know, running for the school board isn't really going to achieve that for you. I can say, yeah, but I will make valuable connections that take me one step closer to achieving my goal. So it's not about being rigid. There's many ways to get here from there. So let's say you want to start your own company and you have an offer from a large organization. Instead of saying, well, this is not a startup, maybe I won't learn the right thing. If you get to learn P&L, marketing a product, running a large business unit, that may be bringing you closer to your goal. So it really is grounded in what your vision is. So how do you know whether this is going to bring you closer to your goal? You don't. Uh, actually, you really need to ask the questions, right? And so you have to ask during the interview exactly what you're going to get to work on, what are some of the opportunities you're going to have to grow, and some of the examples of how it can, this can go badly is I've talked to a young woman in the past, for example, who had accepted a job offer but was reorged before the start date, right? So what she ended up doing had nothing to do with the offer she had signed. Sometimes there's a fancy title and it really isn't an accurate representation of the actual job responsibilities you're going to have, to, you're going to have once you start. Sometimes you have a very nice offer, but then you find out the hard way that you don't have enough resources to deliver on the job description that you are given. Sometimes there is a great sounding project in the job description, but once you start probing, you discover that it has no support, it's considered a dead end, or it has low visibility. And then there is the glass cliff situation, which comes out of research that showed that women are more likely to get job offers that are uh, high-risk situations where there's not enough support to get the job done. Uh, so the above, all the above situations, even though they sound pretty bad, they can work if they're in line with your career goals and you know that you will get out of it what you need to further your goals. And so for that, I think you really need to think about asking some pointed questions of the hiring manager and the interview team about exactly what are the resources for this job that I'm going to do, uh, who will I be working with, what kind of executive support is there for this project, and really looking a little bit more past the job description to see if what you will get to work on is exactly in line. The second dimension to consider is what are the growth opportunities? Is this offer potentially opening the door to growth opportunities that you need to achieve your vision for your career in the future. Sheryl Sandberg in her uh, tech talk and also in her Grace Hopper talk talked about all that matters is growth. So that's her perspective on career decisions, right? She took a job at um, Google and there was a, a, a title in a new area. Nobody had done this job before and she really was unclear and about whether that was really going to build her resume and Eric Schmidt told her we're a growing company, the opportunities are limitless and all that matters is whether you will grow. And so some of the things to consider um, when you're considering whether this company will have a lot of growth opportunities for you in the future is, is this organization growing or is it downsizing? Is it innovating in new markets? Is it using legacy technology or is it developing new platforms and with new methods? And I think this is extremely important um, for technical women to consider because a lot of people in tech, even though there are a lot of job opportunities, companies are looking for very specific technical skills. And one of the issues is that people get stale really fast in high tech. If you get stuck working on a legacy piece of technology, and you don't have the support for, from your company or the opportunity to develop new technical skills, you can kind of get yourself out of the market pretty quickly. So that's a very important dimension to consider. 
Um, how to find out besides asking uh, the interviewing team, uh, you can seek out connections who work there if they tell you, you know, there's been lots of downsizing, that's an indication right there, but they may be growing in one area and downsizing in another and you want to be in the high growth area. Uh, you can ask questions through online communities and one of the tools that I found really, really helpful uh, to keep up with companies and what's going on is Google Alerts. Um, so if you're interested in knowing what kind of uh, markets these companies are considering, what kind of innovations they're putting out there, that's a great way to do that. Colleagues and community, that's uh, extremely important, especially for technical women. So one of the barriers uh, for technical women is pervasive isolation. And even though you may be used to being the only woman in the room, it can get really uh, tiring over time. And also it heightens the possibility of, of bias and stereotyping when you're in the only woman at the table. It just opens the door to tokenism and unconscious bias. And so being the only woman on the team uh, can get old extremely fast. So I would uh, advise to look for diversity in teams, in the managing teams and the interviewing teams that are hiring you. And if there is no diversity on the team, I would still ask the question about what is, you know, what do you think about diversity? What's your diversity strategy? How do you make sure you have women on the team? Uh, I think it's perfectly okay to ask that question. And then beyond the demographic composition of the team, uh, and I added here actually the power of three. Uh, life is painful when you're the only woman. Life is still painful when there's two. But when there's three, um, it starts to get a little better. Uh, it's a little bit more of a community. So hopefully the organization you're considering has many more um, in technical role, but let's say it's a small organization. Um, then I, if you have a, a small group of three, there can be a little bit more support there. One of the important signals is whether there is a woman on the interviewing team and often the only woman you will get to talk to on an interviewing team is the HR representative. Um, uh, and I think it's important to consider whether there are other technical women at that organization. You want to also probe for that team's culture uh, beyond the demographic composition of a team because just because there's a diverse team doesn't mean that they're actually good at leveraging diversity for innovation. So asking whether, and trying to find out whether they trust each other, whether they're encouraged to openly discuss ideas, how do they handle conflict? Is it about who's the loudest and who is the most assertive or are there mechanisms in this team to make sure that all voices are heard? Those are the hallmarks of a team that values diversity and really knows how to get how to make sure that different types of personalities and backgrounds are heard in the process and different types of perspectives. I think um, the best way to do that is to simply ask to do your say, I would like to speak to a few team members on a one on one basis during the interview process. Uh, especially pay attention to what other women are saying. And one of the extreme examples that I've had is I um, had a friend who was interviewing for a job as a technical woman. Um, and she, you know, was hearing great things from all the interviewing teams and then she spoke to another woman and the other woman said, don't take the job because this is not a good group. And, and so that gave her just, it doesn't mean that she shouldn't take the job. It means that she should talk to even more people to see if that's a common experience in that group uh, that this woman felt especially isolated and unheard. So beyond the group, there's the community of the whole organization. So ask yourself, what's the social fabric of the company and how do they support technical women, right? Again, it goes back to the common experience of technical women of isolation and lack of access to those influential networks. You could look for whether there's a women's network at the organization, a technical women's group. What are some of the opportunities for networking and one of the good um, hallmarks here is what kind of social events um, are common and how inclusive are they, right? So it does, does tell you something if it's only video gaming, the social events. And while you may be a video gamer, that's absolutely fine, 
but it may, if it's only video gaming, that means that some of the people who aren't interested in that are probably not feeling as part of the culture and in the loop. And that just kind of constrains the opportunity for networking. Is it bar hopping after hours, which a lot of women who have uh, child rearing responsibilities find difficult? If it's only about bar hopping, then you have an issue because if you have to go home after work and you can't join that group, then you're feeling really isolated. And I'll give you an example of one of my friends. Um, he, he's a man, not a woman. He's a man and he was working in a startup and he was um, at least about 10 years older on average than all the other colleagues he was working with. And he was coming into work at seven in the morning uh, and then he was leaving at five in, at night so he can be having dinner with his kids. And what would happen in a startup is the culture was such that people would come into work at 11 a.m. and then they would stay and then they would eat pizza and keep working and then they would all go to bars. And so he found himself um, kind of out of the loop pretty quickly because most of the important decisions were being made during those bar hours that were after hours and really contingent upon people not having children to go back to in the evening. So that was an example of a social kind of a social event and the social fabric was not really inclusive of his needs. Another thing to really look for is whether there is a mentoring culture at that company. That's a significant determinant of a company's success at advancing um, diversity and really having them as a part of the culture. So uh, it doesn't have to be a formal mentoring program. That's not what this is about. It's about our managers encouraged to mentor others, our executives mentoring others. Uh, is it a part of what they do, a natural part of this organizational culture that people are expected to help develop others and not just worry about their own advancement? So again, how you find that out is to seek out and talk to others who work at the company, looked at LinkedIn, Glassdoor, for some large organizations, has a lot of reviews uh, that really talks about the different cultural experiences that people have had at different companies. And then once you start, you really want to take advantage of all these mentoring and networking opportunities um, and remember to really make time for them because they will significantly contribute to your career advancement. Opportunities for advancement and the advancement process. While you may be reluctant to, I mean, it, it does sound a little bit, um, maybe a little too gutsy to be in an interview situation and say, well, once I start working for you, how will you advance me, right? It can sound a little bit arrogant. But you want to understand how their advancement process is handled. What is their culture when it, when it comes to advancing people? Because in some organizations, the dirty little secret is that the best way to advance is to leave the company and then come back. Um, that's not a culture that's really focused on employee development. So one of the first markers I would say is first is looking whether there's diversity at the top in technical roles. Where are the women in this organization? Are they all found at the bottom? Uh, are they stuck at a certain level? So you can ask around and then you can ask you know, what they're doing about it. If they don't have any women on their executive team and on their board, that's a signal. And you can, you can ask around, why, what is the strategy to change this? And how is this company making sure that women are appropriately represented in decision-making positions? So the things to consider uh, is looking at the executive profile web pages of a company. You can also search for their patents on the U.S. Patent Office website and see who's patenting, who's creating technology, and recognize you know, whether there's a good representation of women, men and women. And then ask, you can ask to talk to specific people about the diversity strategy of the organization, um, and they should be able to give you some pretty concrete answers. You will also want to ask whether they promote from within. So it's not just about having women at the top, but also asking the question, were these women groomed from within? Did they get the opportunities for development that they needed to advance from within? So making sure there's this internal pipeline for advancement is really important. One of the drivers of um, 
an advancement pro process is the type of culture you're going to join. And that's going to determine a little bit of what your experience is uh, for advancement. So this is my stab at mapping cultural types with what you're likely to see on promotion uh, process. And I think it's a little complex, but it's important to consider. Um, some companies are really tenure driven. Uh, so, you know, in, in a tenure driven company, you, you know, once you start, that you have to put in X number of years before you can be considered for promotion. And this may very well work well for you, right? But if you're looking to advance quickly, that could be a problem. So, you know, the hallmarks of a tenure driven culture, just ask people how long they've been there. It's a great sign if, if they've been there a long time because that means this organization is retaining them. But you can ask, well, how many years does it take typically to, to get from this level to the next level? And it gives you, you know, a little bit of a, of a clue as, as to whether tenure, the culture is really tenure driven. Um, collaborative versus competitive. Uh, this one is really important because collaborative organizations uh, do better at um, leveraging diversity for innovation. Uh, collaboration is critical to innovation, but a lot of companies may have collaboration in their core values, but then they stack rank people in their evaluations, right? So how is collaboration rewarded beyond the buzzword on the PowerPoint? How is it recognized and how is it rewarded? Uh, I think that's a very um, important question to ask because not only will it influence your promotion, because if in a company where it's all about individual contribution, you may not be recognized for your collaboration on a specific project. Um, and so I would really ask if collaboration rewarded and recognized. Hierarchical versus flat. Is advancement tied to having specific titles and degrees, or is it more tied to lateral moves? This is something that can help you navigate and identify the right opportunities. And then the last one is one that I dub uh, that's probably the more important is employee centric versus Wall Street centric. And this one is are going back to this mentoring and development culture, are managers accountable for employee engagement? and employee advancement? And how are they accountable for diversity? Who is rewarded for making sure that employees are engaged, happy, productive, that people get to spend some of their time at work on this the most passionate about? So a company that cares in a very meaningful way about employee engagement is that a company that's gonna be much more innovative and while well, you'll have a better experience. Okay, um, so my personal ideal combination is employee-centric, collaborative, uh, and this is based on, on research on what makes for a more inclusive and diverse culture. Employee-centric, collaborative, and results-oriented um, is more innovative and more inclusive. And again, where you can look for information on that you can look on Glassdoor on some of the experience of what people are, have been experiencing at that company, ask to connect people on LinkedIn, ask them questions, ask questions in your social networks. You can look at the best companies to work for, which is best based on employee engagement data, and talking to a lot of people to really understand if they really find their work meaningful, if they're engaged, and if their company cares about their engagement. Support. Companies that pay attention to technical women pay attention to supporting them because they recognize that technical women are in a minority and that they want to retain them and that it's difficult to be in the minority. So providing women with networking opportunities, opportunities for mentoring, role models, sponsorship, and professional development opportunities. So workplace support in a recent um, study done by Nadia Fuad and her colleague of women engineers, they found that workplace support, the kind of key infrastructure that was in place to support women, was a key predictor of women engineers remaining with an employer. So how do you find that? Again, ask others who work there. 
Ask the hiring manager about how they handle professional development opportunities. What are those opportunities? What are some of the networking groups? And pay attention to, to the benefits um, and all of these programs that companies have in place. And then once you start, you have to use them. I think there's nothing more frustrating when companies are trying to put in those support structures in place and have such a hard time getting people to sign up for them. So it's really important that then you leverage them because they can really make a positive difference in your career. This one is number six, but I could have put it number one. It's probably uh, one of the most important um, factors. Um, who is going to be your manager? And is that manager good? Uh, you know, Kurt Kaufman in First Break All the Rules did the famous quote of people join organizations, but they leave managers. Um, in one study by the Harvard uh, Business School, women in the early career stage were significantly more likely to leave their job because of a difficult manager versus only 16% of men. And this is no different for technical women because when you're in a minority situation where life is already a little bit harder, um, you need a manager who is supportive and who gets it and who's aware. And again, who is held accountable for employee engagement or if that manager is not held accountable for employee engagement, it at least cares about employee engagement on his team and cares about not only keeping his uh, employees, but promoting them, right? And that's something that's really difficult for managers to do because if you have a great team and you're a manager in a large company, you don't want to lose your people. But the best thing to do as a manager is show that you can advance people and promote them out of your team sometimes. So how do you find that out? I would say talk to others who have worked for this manager. Do they recommend him or her? Um, and how much turnover has there been on, in this team? I think you can talk to people who are not reporting to that manager and say, hey, you're on a different group. What do you think of so-and-so? Is he or she a good leader? What do people have to say? And usually people will be pretty forthcoming. Um, and the, the same study on women engineers found that you know, while the support system in place at companies matters a great deal, one of the biggest factors in retention is that microclimate, the microclimate that is set by supervisors and colleagues who either support women or undermine them. So it has a profound influence on the experience you're going to have at that company. Um, and, you know, here's one, one silly example, but I've heard it so many times, right? I've heard from so many technical women, you know, I don't know why, but I'm always the person that that manager points to for note taking in meetings. You know, just a very subtle inequity that just becomes painful over time. And those are the kind of small characteristics that just undermine the experience of technical women as equals as part of this team. Oops, sorry. Work life fit. Um, you know, it's interesting because in all my work um, with technical women, often they talk about work-life fit and work-life balance being one of the biggest barriers that they face, but then they're very tired of talking about it and they're not really interested in rehashing it and it seems to be an intractable problem. Um, I think it's extremely important to consider work-life fit when you look for a position. And it's not about whether you have kids or not. It's not about um, being a mother. Um, you want to look for a company who will support your work-life fit needs, whatever those needs are. If those needs are that you like to spend 100 hours at work, and you, but you want to be able once a year to go visit your elderly parent in another country, that's your need. That's OK. And so first, I would ask yourself, what are your life fit needs? Uh, family and dependent care, your partner and his or her career, and what do you need to feel fulfilled in terms of community, family, and work? And to go through these questions, I highly recommend this book by Callie Williams Yost. It's called Work Plus Life, um, and it really helps guide you through these questions. And it's not just a question for now, it's also a question for later. Are you expecting to start a family in the next five years? Will that affect your experience at this company, right? And just make an informed decision. 
you want to know whether the face, the culture is about face time or about results. And if the culture is about face time, maybe you decide that you want to join it, right? Maybe you say, I'm okay with face time, but know that that's going to be the expectation and that may impact your ability to have flexibility, right? How much flexibility is there? Can you work from home sometimes if an emergency comes up? And again, there's not only the policy of the company, but what that manager believes, right? So sometimes there's a great work-life policy in place, but that manager absolutely does not adhere to it, right? So these are important questions to ask because your work-life fit needs will change over time. So here's an example from a, my friend Jerry. She went to an interview once and the interview was going really well. And that's a little bit of an extreme example, granted. Uh, Jerry's a single woman. She doesn't have kids. So her work-life fit wasn't about having kids. But um, she's in the interview and she notices all these mattresses on the floor. It was a startup, so you wouldn't see that at a large company, hopefully. And the interviewing manager, and she asked, what are those? And he said, well, those are the beds we sleep on when we pull all-nighters. And um, she said, really? And how often does that happen? And he said, well, it's regularly. You know, that's what we expect from our employees. We're hardcore, and sometimes we just have to go 24-7. And she was kind of puzzled. And to her, that was the signal that she did not want to join that organization, right? So it's an extreme example, but there are other uh, markers. And really act, asking people what the work-life expectations are um, is really important, whether people feel supported in their work life fit. So my friend's example, Jean, which I mentioned earlier, he wanted to have dinner with his kids um, in the evening because he was coming in at 7 a.m. in the morning. That meant he couldn't go bar hopping with the others. And then he started hearing at his review that, you know, we really question your commitment to this company. You're not really committed. You're never here in the evenings, even though he was putting in more hours and probably more results uh, than many of his colleagues. So those are some of the signals. Um, so more on work-life fit. Um, it's the key factor in turnover, regardless of your career stage, regardless of your family responsibilities. And actually, um, I think the U.S. being the only industrial country, if you're in the U.S., uh, the only industrial country without paid parental leave, it makes you completely dependent on having an employer who will support a paid maternity leave. But again, I wouldn't ask the hiring manager. There's significant stigma that remains about, especially about women needing flexibility. And if you're in a hiring situation and you say, well, what is your work-life balance? I think um, you could get significant backlash. So what you want to do there is be more subtle about the way you find out, look at the company policies, and then ask people that you can trust with that question. Location. Um, it's often not mentioned in, in these elements, but I think it's important because in all the work um, that I've had the opportunity to do uh, with technical women, I've found that the culture that they are experiencing can really differ based on location. Being in a branch location of a company can mean a very different experience. So a company may have great mentoring support and a women's networking group and all these great things for you to take advantage of, but then you find yourself in a branch location where there's nobody there and there's no networking, there's no mentoring. So just because a company has it as a policy doesn't mean you'll find these markers at your location. It is also difficult to be sometimes in a branch location if your work is invisible to the headquarters. So you want to see what are the opportunities to network with headquarters, what are the opportunities to make your work visible to headquarters. So, um, and also what is, are the opportunities for advancement at this location, right? So my husband, used to work for a company, a headquarter on the East Coast, and he was in the Valley. And at some point, at least they were very honest about it. They said, you know, if you want to advance, you have to move to the East Coast. That's just the way it is. And so once you find that out, you can make an informed decision. So uh, that's all I have for you. I have some questions. 
Deanna, are you going to moderate the question? Yeah. Or do you want me to? Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, Lisa chatted in a question, and she's asking, can I address the situation? Can you address the situation where you're taking your way into a company and they like you? And there's no specific job opening, but they indicate they could create one. So there is an extra task of essentially defining what you and they want you to be hired to do. I love this. Actually, I think that's a fantastic opportunity. That's a wonderful opportunity because um, if there is this kind of um, if they recognize your skills that you bring into the table and you have the opportunity to kind of help define the position, if you take this self-reflection about your career goals and what you really want to get out of this position, there really is an opportunity to define a win-win position uh, for you and for that company. I think it's actually a great situation to be in. So um, our next question is from Julie. Uh, what are some of the best ways to subtly suss out mm -hmm. about work-life balance and also flexibility on schedule and telecommute. A really important one, especially if you're living in an urban area. Yes, uh, and this is a really good question. And, and unfortunately, like I said earlier, there's a lot of uh, stigma associated with flexibility. And there's actually a great literature that, especially if you're a mother, that penalty is significant. So there's a whole uh, set of research showing something called the motherhood penalty for when, and, and the, the penalty is not just for women caregivers, but men caregivers who ask about who ask about flexibility are also likely to experience bias because we are in this uh, culture of constant availability. I think what you want to do is to really ask other employees. Um, you don't want to ask the hiring manager, but you want to ask other people who work who work at that company. So what one thing that I would do, um, for example, is let's say I don't know anyone who works at this company that I'm hiring. I would go on LinkedIn. I would start poking around, see if I knew people two or three steps removed from me, and start asking questions. Um, uh, you can also ask questions in some of the online communities of technical women ask questions on Twitter, and then you all can also go to Glassdoor, which has a whole section of, on work-life fit, and people talk about their experiences with work-life balance at that company. Again, it may or may not be representative of that, specific, um, of that specific group you're joining, but also talking to other people who have worked for this manager and knowing what he or she uh, thinks about these issues and whether people feel supported in their need for work life um, significantly. You know, if I can add to that, um, something that I've noticed as well is even if a company has a policy about um, commuting, um, you know, working from home, you know, make sure that you double check that with the manager that you're interviewing as well because oftentimes managers will have, you know, different practices in different groups. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that, you know, what the policy is is aligning with what the manager's uh, goals and objectives are. And sometimes they don't always meet. Yeah, and it really is about creating a win-win for the manager and for you. So um, if you know that you can earn it over time, often you can't get a flexible schedule when you start. Um, but if you know that this manager at least believes in people earning it and that it's an ongoing negotiation between the employee and the manager, I think you can really have um, a, a good outcome. Okay, so we have a uh, first thank you for all of the great comments. Um, you know, we agree that this is a really important topic and one um, that we haven't seen really addressed. Uh, you know, there, so we're glad that you're um, getting a lot of uh, good information from this. And we also hope that um, when I send out a survey later on uh, today, if you can be really candid in feedback, if there's something that we missed, um, or if there's some other topics like this that you feel are really important to you. Um, that you definitely let us know about that. Um, there's a really great question here. Um, uh, there's uh, someone here who's looking for a new opportunity right now. I have thought about the glass cliff, um, and that seems to be so prevalent right now in, in the media. And this is definitely a role that will have a number of challenges to address. Because I've worked with the leadership team at other companies, I don't think I'd be set up to fail. Mm. Um, so can you recommend language for addressing this with them? That's great. Um, that's a great uh, 
great, great comments. So um, the glass cliff, for those who want more clarification on that, it came out of research that shows that for a job description, if you take an experiment, you have a job description that basically describes a group or a company in dire straits and everything's falling apart and there's no support, people are significantly likely, more likely to pick the woman candidate. And if the job description makes it sound very set up uh, and very well defined, then people are more likely to pick the male candidate. So there seems to be an inherent bias towards um, situations and job descriptions unconscious bias, mind you, but situations and job descriptions that are more likely to be set up for failure. Um, I think uh, the fact that you've worked with these people before um, is really important. And I think you asking the question, um, just what kind of support will I have to do this? Are there resources? What are the challenges that you see? Uh, how will I get help to address them? And what are my metrics for success? What will I be measured on, right? I think that's really important because if it's completely impossible and then you're held accountable for essentially defying gravity, it's very different than if you're expected to provide a meaningful contribution to this turnaround process or whatever difficult situation you're dealing with. Um, and so I think also talking to other people who work um, at this company and in this group and know about this position and asking them, what are the odds of this succeeding? What do you think? You know, and if they acknowledge, yeah, you know, this is going to be really hard, but we're in it together. It's a different, um, it's a definitely a different feel. Um, and if you feel like you're completely um, set up for failure. And then the last thing I would mention about the glass cliff, and it, it can still be a very good opportunity as long as you go in with your eyes open, that you're going to get to try this high-risk position. And maybe it's a huge step up for you. It has a great title. And, and it's OK as long as you don't internalize right, the situation you've been put in and then beat yourself up for not being able to deliver on something that was not really set up right to begin with. When you're really at an advantage because you know the people that um, you're going to be working with and you have a history with them before. So you know what kind of people they're going to be when things get really um, stressful and, and you know, you're forced to make those choices that you're going to have to make. Um, so that's a real advantage in your situation. So um, Connie uh, has a great question here, and I agree with her. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wary of best company lists. Yeah. Um, it seems that many are based on uh, programs or initiatives within a company, regardless of how effective they might be. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, absolutely. I wouldn't put a lot of weight in those uh, lists. However, the Fortune Best Companies to Work For list does look at employee engagement data. So they are based on survey data of employees. Now, they don't do a breakdown of by gender, as, as far as I know. So. Again, you may not be able to find out, right? Um, I would, my thoughts on this is that your biggest source of information is other people who have worked there and left and why they left and people who are currently working there. Already much better than best, best company list. I view best company list as once one data point, one source of information, but like good technical people who like to do their research view it as it's all part of a big picture that you're trying to, to, to paint for yourself. It's a big triangulation process, right? So I completely agree with that. Yes, and I just noted uh, today in the media, um, there's a woman who's been named as uh, the best mother um, of the year, a woman in tech, I and that. I think, wow, the pressure must be on. <laughs> I'll never be able to yell at my child after that. <laughs> I'm wondering what it really takes to be the best mother and technical woman at the yeah. same time. So we'll have to read more on that. <laughs> um, Sarah asks, is it possible as a woman uh, to move from the senior manager level to the director VP level while still mm. maintaining some work-life fit? So thank you for that question. Um, I'm currently working on a work-life initiative um, in, my, in my current job. And so I've been reviewing a lot of literature. And the problem is that most flexibility policies are framed as only acceptable if they come at the cost of advancement. 
in many organizations. So in many companies, you can have work-life fit, but you're kind of benched, right? And so is it possible? Yes, it is, but it's very hard to find. So in a lot of organizations, and this is because most companies and most workplaces are based on the needs of the 20th century worker. It was meant to design structures for the 1950s where everybody, mostly men, had to stay at home, mostly women. Um, and so advancement was predicated upon having that support at home. The whole structure is still based on that. And now that is changing, but it's changing slowly. So um, in some organizations, that change is happening. Um, you have some companies where you ask around and you do see that senior level people have at least, if not work-life balance, at least work-life flexibility, right? A good amount of flexibility. So I would, I would look for a culture where that flexibility is the norm. Uh, so you may not have balance, but if you have flexibility and it's okay for you to attend your family and shift your time around as long as you're getting the results done, that's good. And again, it's based on, is this culture based on results more than on space time or number of hours put in? And um, a great resource on, on this topic, her name is Joan Williams at UC Hastings College of the Law, and she had a great editorial this month talking about how this, how this culture of long work hours is so much more about masculinity than it is, than it is about productivity, right? It's about, it's about showing who's toughest. Um, and that's just not a very, good, um, a very good culture. And I've talked to some executives who say that actually they're able to have more work like this as executives because now they have gatekeepers. And uh, they're the ones basically in the driver's seat. If somebody wants to meet with them, they get to say, you know, work with my assistant and this and that. So I think sometimes once you achieve a certain level of authority, it can actually, um, oddly enough, be a little easier to have work like this. But you have to make it very clear for yourself if you're in that position what you will and will not do and create some boundaries because um, I think. Um, if you don't give yourself those boundaries, it's going to be very difficult to maintain. Well, and obviously looking for role models, um, if you're looking for this type of a promotion within an organization, you know, looking at other women who are reporting to the same person you would be reporting to, you know, looking at, you know, you can get a pretty good beat on their work-life fit. Um, obviously, there's some people who just like the workaholics and regardless of where they work, they're going to work that way. Um, but, you know, finding those role models in the organization, if it's a new organization, you know, networking and trying to find, you know, women at that level, what their work-life fit is yeah. um, in advance. And a lot of them, you know, if you're really upfront with them and you, you know, say, can we have coffee? I want to have an informational interview with you. They're, they're really likely to do it. And you can get a really good feel for what your work-life fit is going to be in the new organization. Yeah, and women and men, actually. You know, the more I talk to, to uh, men in the workplace, the more they have these concerns, too. And, you know, I talk to uh, male executives who say, well, I leave twice a week, coach Little League. I don't know why people think I don't have a life, but it's not like I'm advertising it, right? And this, this belief that, that because I'm in this position, I can't possibly have other interests. So I think it's important for them to send that message to Right. Well, and, but I was actually in a situation where I was an executive and m my male boss um, coached a little, a little league team and he would leave at five o'clock. But if I had left, that would not be acceptable. Right. So, right. Um, you know, sometimes there's a double standard as yeah. well. And you need Absolutely. to check that out. So someone's typing a question. <laughs> I don't want to cut it off. Um, just to let you know, um, we're going to be putting this presentation online as well as I've been writing down the resources that Carolyn's been talking about. So if I don't know where to find them, I will find out. And make sure that all of these resources and links are put up there as well so that you have access to all of them. Oh, yeah. Rena just posted about uh, the recent piece on NPR that shows that research shows that actually you have less stress if you're in a higher position of authority. 
Um, and so this trust level of people that are CEOs or in charge is lower than those who are at the mid-level uh, because you, are, you have more control. And so, yeah, it's not exactly on work-life fit, but it is an indicator of how much control you can actually gain over your life if you have a lot of people reporting to you, for example, you have resources uh, that can help with the work like this. That's a really good point, Rena. And I'll make sure that this link also gets up on the resource that's list a, that's as well. A great piece of research. All right. Well, I don't think there's any other questions. Oh, so somebody's, somebody's typing. typing. <laughs> Another good indicator on work life fit, actually, and I think that's the hardest thing for um, companies to do, is to enable people to scale back for a certain time in their life when they need to, but then providing a mechanism for them to ramp back up, right? So often what happens is people scale back and it's considered acceptable, but then there's no mechanism. It kind of drops them out of the high potential pool, and then there's no mechanism to bring them back into the fast track. So it's really important, the companies who are, who are really good at work-life fit provide a mechanism for you to have that fit, but also, let's say you want to come back on the fast track, there needs to be a mechanism for that. Oh, Kelly isn't typing anymore. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're getting used to this tool too. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Kelly just said thank you and she wants to share it with her colleagues. That's wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. Well, um, we hope that uh, you got some things out of here that are useful to you. Um, we really hope that you share this with your friends um, and people that you know are um, in a position to look at their next options. And, uh, and we hope that you recommend the series to them. Uh, Global Tech Women is in the midst of, of setting up several programs. Um, so please sign up for our newsletter on our website, globaltechwomen.com, if you have not done so already. Um, I see that the PowerPoint slide for uh, today's presentation is already up, so you can download that at your leisure. I will also have it up as well on the, the website. Um, if you know of interesting speakers who you'd like to see on here, um, please uh, let us know. I will be sending out an evaluation to you, or you can just email me directly, as well as any particular topics as you're going through you know, the course of your life. Is there something interesting that you would like to discuss further, like this NPR um, uh, session that was done. It would be, I think it would be interesting to have a chat about, um, you know, what does it really mean as you're going up the ladder um, that you have less stress and what would that take? What kind of shift in your own personal thinking would that require? We've had that debate many times <laughs> Absolutely. As, as we've been struggling with balance ourselves. Mm -hmm. So um, we, that would be an excellent topic. Yeah, that's great. And, and some of the tips that you've learned into how to figure out whether a job offer is the right fit for you would be great for us to hear. Yeah, um, yeah. And if you use these things, you know, let us know. You know, let us know your stories as you're you're going through your uh, next phase. And if if something here was helpful to you, you know, send us an email and let us know about it. Thank you so much. It was a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, Todd, we're turning it back over to you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Cool.